Thank you for being here. As you probably suspect by now, I'm going to be talking about UPnP and uh, UPnP mapping. Um, this is a turbo talk, so obviously this is going to be a little fast. I'm going to try to go into as much details as I can, but uh, any other questions or whatever, you can just go to the Q&A and I'll answer any questions. So let's do a brief introduction. Uh, who am I? Not very important, but I'm a security researcher. I started working with security at the tender age of 14. Um, I used to hang out on Undernet and uh, work with uh, ISPs uh, back in the Dominican Republic, which is where I'm from, uh, cable companies and all that. So that's that. Um, what is UPnP? Uh, UPnP is universal plug and play. Universal plug and play is uh, technology made by the UPnP forum, um, which is a code name for Microsoft. <laughs> Um, they made it back in 1999, and the name probably gave it away that it was something made by Microsoft. Um, the point of UPnP is to make devices work seamlessly, um, be it uh, connectivity devices or networking devices or media devices. There are also other uh, devices that can be used, but mostly uh, that's what UPnP is used for. So as you probably suspect making devices work seamlessly is not a very good idea or it's a good idea but it's not very plausible. Um, we're going to talk about specifically uh, IGDs or the part of UPnP that works with uh, networking devices. Um, as you probably suspect to make the network devices uh, work seamlessly you need NAT traversal. Um, how many of you were, raise your, hand, raise your hands if you were in the Dan Kaminsky talk? All right. So you probably get the idea or the basic idea. Um, basically, basically, a device on the LAN uses UPnP to automatically add port mappings uh, on the device so that extra one devices can access uh, the, the LAN, uh, which is a great idea. Uh, but as you will see, it's not that great if you make it like UPnP does. So IGDs are basically found mostly on DSLs uh, and uh, some other devices. Cable modems, not that much because cable modems usually are bridged. But if something is uh, routing and it's doing PPP, it's probably doing uh, IGD. So. Uh, big question, and uh, I've been working with uh, Dan Kaminsky on this one, on how many IGD devices are online, and a shed load. I mean, it's amazing. We, we, have, uh, we thought we would have a minority of the devices uh, on the net, but I have personally saw, seen uh, half a million devices across different countries uh, open and accepting uh, UPnP requests. So um, let me, first of all, explain a little bit of how UPnP works briefly. Uh, basically, you start with a discovery process, which is, relies on multicast UDP. Um, it sends a multicast UDP, and any device listening uh, replies back with a, a unicast UDP. This unicast UDP, I probably you can't read it very well, but it's in the white paper. Um, it describes or points out a uh, location, which is just an XML file describing the different services and devices available uh, to execute on that UPnP device. After you get that uh, unicast, uh, which is the blue part, the yellow part, you get uh, to the green part, with this, which is uh, unicast TCP. Basically, uh, it's SOAP requests uh, and uh, uh, after that, after you get the SOAP request, uh, the description of the device through XML, you get send a SOAP request, which maps support. Uh, you probably can't see it either, but uh, over here you have different arguments that you can use, like uh, uh, least duration of the port mapping, uh, internal client, external port, and uh, remote host. Basically, your basic port mapping uh, arguments. 
So, so let's do a bit of the UPnP hacking timeline. Uh, it started in 2001. Uh, came from FTU Security. He found a couple of uh, denial of service attacks for the Windows XP stack. Obviously, UPnP was implemented in Windows XP first. Uh, Microsoft wanted to uh, promote the technology. Then in 2001, uh, again, uh, EI published uh, buffer overflows for the same stack. You probably remember that one. Uh, it was pretty popular. Uh, then in 2003, Bjorn Stickler uh, talked about uh, UPnP information disclosure. Now, there's not a lot of information uh, that's uh, being thrown out by UPnP, but it's enough. It's, uh, it's, it's not that good. You'll see with the demo uh, how much information we can get. And uh, then in 2006, Armin Hermel, that's a typo over the, the R missing, he started publishing uh, UPnP facts on the site upnphacks.org. And uh, he's basically, let's say, like one of the fathers of uh, UPnP hacking. He has examined uh, all the UPnP stacks and described which stacks allow uh, some actions and whatnot. And then in 2008, we had uh, an attack by New Citizen, uh, which uh, was pretty smart. It basically relied on the clients, internal clients of a network, uh, sending SOAP through JavaScript. And uh, basically the purpose of that was opening the web administration port of clients that access uh, sites and such. So. What are the main problems of UPnP? Well, first of all, it uses the word plug and play. I don't, even, I don't know if you guys remember Windows 98 and plug and play and the whole idea. It didn't work. I mean, it's not <laughs> rocket science. And every time I see plug and play anywhere, I just have to look it up because I don't want to go through the same nightmares I, that we went through in the early or late 90s. Um, so the other thing with plug and play, it's a pretty nice idea. We would love to have things uh, plug and play, but it doesn't work good with uh, security. I mean, you can't have secure devices uh, plug and play, being plug and play. I mean, you need to authenticate something, you need to uh, ask questions and all that. Well, that's one of the main problems of UPnP too. UPnP has no authentication whatsoever at all. In fact, the only way they um, consider an entity uh, that could actually execute commands. It's just if they have an IP assigned for, and which is ridiculous. I mean, it's like DEF CON uh, sitting down and, and saying, oh, how are we gonna let people in? How would we know who we would let in? And then someone said, if they exist, they can't come in, which is ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> don't even go through it. Um, after that, uh, the other problems are that uh, most stacks do not validate data. And uh, what we mean by this is that, first of all, UPnP was made or designed for land use only. And uh, that's not true, unfortunately. Uh, but not only that, port mappings were designed to work for internal hosts that wanted to traverse the net and add port mappings. So in this case, um, most stacks, or a lot of stacks, uh, do not check if the internal IP is actually in, on the LAN or internal. So what that uh, actually allows us is to stick any IP that we want in that port mapping. So if I want to, say, add a port mapping at uh, the device pointing to uh, Amazon IP uh, port 80, it's doable. Uh, in most devices, which is also a little bit uh, weird. Um, the other problem is, as I was saying, uh, UPnP was designed for uh, LAN use, and uh, most or a lot of devices uh, use or allow indiscriminate one requests. I mean, requests of UPnP actions coming from the one, which is doesn't make any sense. In fact, the uh, UPnP protocol uh, says not to do that. But to be, <laughs> it's uh, that the IGD version one protocol says specifically it's not recommended to do that. Uh, 
um, to get them credit though on the IGD version 2 uh, paper, they uh, made that uh, sentence on caps, so I guess they're making a better point now. <laughs> and on the other hand, we have devices that don't even log UPnP requests. I mean, we can play with it, do whatever we want with it, and no one will ever see it because the device doesn't have the capacity of logging in, which is also a bit weird. Um, there's also a ton of uh, other problems. Uh, we have command execution on some stacks, uh, and as you saw, the nano service and buffer rule flows. In fact, the nano service is so bad that when I was programming uh, UMAP or the tool I'm going to showcase, I accidentally crashed my modem like a thousand times, and I didn't even do anything. I'm just sending bad requests, and the device will go dead. So the devices affected so far, we don't know yet how many devices are affected, but obviously uh, some vendors have taken into account uh, what's been going on, and uh, we have Linksys, uh, Edimax, Sitecom, Broadcom, which is not listed here. But the most common uh, stack on the net, which is vulnerable, is uh, the Speed Touch or Thompson or now Technicolor stack. Um, we have devices roaming around the net on big amounts. So UMAP, uh, the tool, what is it? First of all, it's a SOX proxy server that forwards or pipes the request through UPnP devices. I'm going to explain it a little bit better and a little bit further down the road. Uh, it's also a TCP UDP scanner for hosts behind the IGD net. Basically, we can scan uh, the services of the host inside the NAT from outside. Um, and also a manual port mapper for UPnP devices. So how does it work? As I explained in the first uh, part of the presentation, uh, UPnP relies on multicast. So that uh, is not a very good scenario for uh, a one uh, request uh, or search. Obviously, we can't use uh, multicast on, on the one. So basically, what we do is we skip that part completely, and we just go on to fetching the XML description files, so the locations. Um, it's pretty simple. It's like fetching HTTP files, uh, not that big of a deal. And then it uh, also uses the control part of the UPnP protocol, which is actually what executes the actions or the commands that UPnP allows on devices. Um, so it's, here's a flow diagram of more or less how UMAP works, works. It basically takes a list of IPs and starts scanning for open cont control points or UPnP devices. Uh, once it uh, receives a SOX request, it, uh, if it has a positive uh, UPnP device, it uh, attempts to add the port mapping, then it opens uh, the connection and pipes the uh, connection through to the uh, SOX request or the client that's making the SOX request. Um, and after that, it attempts to delete the port mapping. Um, and this is very uh, needed uh, on UPnP because UPnP does not allow uh, an infinite uh, amount of port mappings. Actually, some devices allow as little as 10 port mappings at a time. So if we actually did a port mapping for every connection, we wouldn't have a very accurate or a very good connection. So we also have the part of scanning the internal host. And basically, it uh, also checks for open control points. Um, uh, then it tries to guess the IP or the internal LAN block that's uh, being used. It adds a port mapping for each IP, internal IP. Let's say if I want to scan port 21 of all the hosts on, on the inside of the LAN, it starts adding port mappings for 10001 and uh, 21, and then tries to map it to an external port. And then the program tries to check if that port is open in the external port on the one IP. 
if it's open, obviously you can establish, establish a connection to, uh, for the internal host and the internal services. And also, uh, it does the deletion of the port mapping. Um, so what are the cons with uh, UPnP mapping? A lot. Uh, first of all, UPnP stacks are buggy and unstable. Um, it was kind of hard, uh, or not that hard, programming UMAP. It's the one uh, being uh, distributed on the CDs are very, it's very buggy, so I would suggest just downloading the new version when I release it uh, tonight on the site. Um, but basically, UPnP stacks, even though they're supposed to be in a standard, they don't behave on the standard, and they're, they have minor differences. Um, the other thing is that obviously we have limited bandwidth um, because we're relying on the upload bandwidth of the devices. Um, and also, uh, we have problems with protocols that have a heavy amount of connections. I mean, we can use UPnP mapping for uh, maybe mapping ports for uh, SSH, uh, maybe some web requests. But uh, if you get something like torrent or whatever, obviously it won't work that well. I mean, if we have only a limit of uh, 150 or 200 mappings at a time, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, and the other thing is that some devices, even though they report that they open the port, they don't. They say everything's OK, 200 OK, and everything in the reply. But when you go and try to connect to the port, uh, you have nothing. <laughs> So that's uh, obviously not very good. So let's do a little demo on UMAP. And uh, let's go for the proxy mode. Let's see if I can get this to work. I had to modify UMAP so that the I real IPs don't show because I don't want my ass thrown in jail and raped. So. Um, when you get the real version, though, you, you can have all the fun you want. Shouldn't matter. In fact, there's also uh, an issue on the, on if this is, it's obviously a, maybe it could be illegal, but not that much, because it's the same idea of an open proxy. It's just someone that has a badly configured device on the net that's allowing people to forward traffic. Obviously, there, you're not authorized for, for, uh, doing port mappings, but it's not actually breaking into the device. Uh, so maybe I won't get my, my ass thrown in jail. So here we go. I'm just going to scan a standard IP block, and it should start running right away. I don't know if you can see it back there. Can you? All right. So. On the right hand here, we have the uh, positive IPs. And as you can see here, we have a lot of details that come out from the device. First of all, we can get the serial number from the device, the model number, uh, who makes it, and the uh, MAC address of the device. This obviously would help also for those devices that come with uh, WEP keys tied to the serial number and all that. So. Uh, that's not good either. So not only that, we also have a group of commands that we can execute on any device. And let me remind you that we are scanning a random block somewhere, and it's not, uh, I mean, we're, we're not doing any tricks. Uh, so here are the commands that we can execute. Um, there are not a lot of interesting commands. Well, maybe or maybe not. So we have the first part that's not on bold, and uh, those are the commands that are, are actually advertised by the device. Now, the ones that are uh, on the bottom are the ones that are not advertised by the device. Obviously, we wanted to try just in case, uh, as any hacker would do, and it works. I mean, if, even if the device doesn't advertise this uh, command, you can still execute the, uh, the command. So, for example, if I want to uh, check out what's the upload and download bandwidth for this device, I could just execute and here we go. We get that this device is running a 
upstream of uh, 350 something and a downstream of uh, 2 max, which is pretty convenient if you want to use for a SOX proxy and you want to <laughs> know what kind of bandwidth or, or latency you want to you're, you're being using. And we also have other commands uh, like uh, forced termination. I assure you, forced termination is not for a contract or anything. It will actually close down the device and close down the connection. So I don't think it, denial of service is even a big deal because if you have a command that actually turns off the device, <laughs> what's the point? I mean, we don't need denial of service. We just have to turn it off. So we also have other uh, commands like add port mapping, which is basically what, uh, what UMAP uh, uses for uh, connections. And we also have these uh, other commands like get username and get password, and they actually work. <laughs> now, on the bright side, those, uh, the username and the password they're talking about is not the administration interface, but uh, the PPP uh, authentication uh, username and password. Now, this is maybe not that bad for some uh, guys because, I mean, uh, there's not much you can do with it. But unfortunately, some providers use uh, the customer number f as a username for the PPP device. So that would also do something that you don't want to and uh, get you some information that you shouldn't have. Uh, let me hit another command. Let's see if, if the username works. There you go. That's a username for the PPP of that device, which is also very weird. So on to the more important stuff, let's go for what I've set up is this UMAP is actually scanning and it opens up a SOX port and uh, you can send a request and it will map it through to that IP that I have selected. Uh, we can test it right here. I've set up a page to show this uh, mapping. Let's see if it works. Remember that UPnP usually is very buggy and unreliable. Then there it goes. It works. Now we have a very disturbing image of Bill Gates over there. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, we have the IP over there. You can test that URL out if you want to, and you can see that it'll point out the IP you're working at. If you can see in UMAP, this is the IP we have selected. Now, if I want to just use another device, like the one below 244.6, then it should work too. Let's see. There we go. In fact, we can go on Google. I'll show you. You should go to the Google for the Dominican Republic as this is a device for the Dominican Republic. Now, as you probably suspect, this is pretty bad. I mean, we have devices like this going on in the Dominican Republic, uh, Colombia, Thailand, a lot of countries, and a lot of devices are going on like that. Um, we also have another functionality of the UMAP, which is scanning for internal hosts. Now, I don't want to do uh, live scanning of uh, the host because uh, most hosts nowadays are using uh, other gateway devices like Linksys, uh, wireless routers and all that, which block all the one requests. But if uh, there are devices that have direct uh, connections to other devices or PCs, then we could actually map. I, let me show you a couple of mappings I did uh, earlier on. Um, now, don't laugh at my lead smudging skills from GIMP. <laughs> So basically, what I want to show you here is UMAP and this number up here on the total positives. Uh, this scan was running for a couple of days, and we got 88,000 devices op with open UP UPnP ports, which is ridiculous. And uh, this is actually uh, a port mapping. As you can see, uh, the smart part is the external IP address in the external port. and uh, we have the internal IP address which uh, the mapping has been made for. We also have another example of 
In this case, for example, I just set it to run to, uh, for that IP and uh, we got uh, Windows IP uh, 10.0.0.5, port 1.3.9, and 4.4.5. Now, this is maybe a bigger problem because obviously you can traverse an app from the one, which is something you don't want. And uh, we have uh, every, all the possibilities. Now, we can't use this sometimes on a uh, on some protocols, let's say, because we have to uh, map these uh, ports for uh, on some of the higher ports. We can't use the same 139 or the 445. So that could make things a little bit more difficult, but it still works. And obviously, if you have an SSH port or an HTTP port, it, it won't matter that much. Um, Keep on working here. So that's the internal land scanning tool. Um, and how do we fix this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's no real solution or, uh, or the best solution. First of all, we need to get everyone to be aware of this and start uh, configuring their devices for UPnP only accepting uh, the uh, action from the LAN side. Now, unfortunately, some devices, even if after you configure them to accept uh, the actions from the LAN side, they just don't work. I mean, you can configure them and they will keep on working on the one side, which is pretty bad too. Um, we also could uh, work with the uh, ISPs, which could uh, do some uh, base configuration to uh, disable by default uh, the uh, UPnP1 request. Um, now this is a big problem because most ISPs just say that's not my problem. That's a customer's problem. I don't want to, you know, it's an uh, industry problem, which is, yeah, deplorable. Um, and uh, on some cases, if you don't have any other choice, you could uh, just disable UPnP all the way, which is not good. I don't know if you guys uh, have used uh, UPnP that much, but I'm a gamer, and uh, you can't play uh, with PlayStation and uh, <laughs> uh, Xbox without UPnP, unless you have some kind of DMC or an external IP address pointing directly at your device. Uh, so mitigation is, is going to be a little difficult, but most people can just configure your, their devices uh, so that they can block the request from the one. Um, as Dan Kaminsky was uh, saying at the previous talk, uh, it's like having a firewall asking people if they want to block or unblock, which is kind of weird because I mean, what should you ask? If obviously, if you configured, you shouldn't be asking. Um, and that's uh, about it. I have any questions or? I'm sorry? Thank you.